separate button on my end. As always, all the recording is just what I'm saying, so if you make any noises, it doesn't go anywhere except between the two of us, I guess, and your 24 closest friends and relations in Astro 322. All right, so uh, today I just want to remind us with some um, uh, logistics here. First off, homework due on Friday. Uh, we were going to have a constants quiz on Friday, but I can't meh find out a way to make that an actual quiz uh, using the tools I have available to me. So we'll just bump it back to later in the term. I promise I'll give you two weeks notice um, for that. So you won't get a sort of on Wednesday, you'll have something to do for Friday. I'll give you plenty of time to sort of, you know, know that this is coming. Uh, next Friday, homework two is due. Post it on to eClass. Uh, thanks to everybody who's been sending in comments uh, and questions about the textbook. I'll be posting chapter two over the weekend. So you you can uh, go ahead and get started reading about stars and stellar populations if that floats your boat. Uh, I am not assigning any reading out of it. It's, uh, you know, welcome to third year class. Uh, these, this is the reading. It sort of gives the full backing of what I want to talk about. Uh, so I hope if you do have questions and come along with that, uh, you'll be able to sort of follow along in the textbook there and ask the questions there. Uh, before I light off across the... Uh, uh, electromagnetic spectrum here. Uh, did you all have any opening questions? You can uh, throw your hands up on Zoom, just start talking, or post them into the lecture questions on Discord. All right, I'm seeing a metric ton of nothing. So, Let's get going. Uh, first thing I want to talk about today is thermal spectra, also known as black body spectra. You have probably seen some formation of this before between your 208, 271, somewhere in Astro, maybe even Physics 124, because I've certainly done this exact set of content to uh, 124 students way back in the day. Uh, but we're going to be a little bit mathematical about this, and we're going to use this expression here for what's called the Planck function. So black body curves are these things that emerge as the spectrum of light from this theoretical construct of a perfectly absorbing, uh, reprocessing, and then emitting uh, object. And if you care about that from the theoretical perspective, you can write down what the emergent property of an isothermal, perfectly opaque object is. Uh, there's derivations of that in 271. It's completely uh, excellent. Uh, and it is interesting from the perspective of quantum mechanics because it motivated the first indications of quantized light. However, uh, from the astrophysics perspective, we care about this because it's a vital reference spectrum. The black body is the spectrum to which everything else gets compared. Nothing is a black body. The closest thing is the universe, and then stars are somewhat, you know, are close to uh, black bodies in certain regimes. Uh, but on average, uh, this is just a good reference, but it is still something we use to sort of describe the properties of a radiation field. And basically, any opaque object has as its underlying spectrum a thermal spectrum with a temperature equal to the temperature of the surface of the object where it becomes opaque. So if we look at the surface of the sun, it has a surface temperature of 5,777 Kelvin in the continuum, in this black body thermal radiation. And then there's an atmosphere on top of it that gives these stellar absorption lines uh, that are going to become quite important uh, in chapter two. Uh, but for now, uh, these are the properties. This is a graph of black body radiation spectra hoovered off of the internet somewhere. Uh, showing here, and it has this kind of characteristic single maximum uh, and with a long tail off to long wavelength radiation and a spectral uh, form that looks a little something like this. This is the expression of Planck's law for the emergent flux from an object um, or the, the received flux from an object at a distance d away, where r, oops, that's not that, 
Uh, R is the radius of a spherical object, and most things we'll care about are spheres. And then D is the distance away, so that's uh, the distance. So there's this geometric dilution factor. This is essentially the uh, inverse square law. And then this B nu is kind of the characteristic reference uh, spectrum that you probably have seen an equation for, may or may not have, who knows. Uh, but that has this form in spectral frequency space, uh, 2h nu cubed over c squared, 1 into the h nu minus over kt minus 1, uh, where we introduce this new constant called k, that's the Boltzmann constant, of uh, which has this value, and it essentially is the calibration of the thermal energy spectrum, uh, or the thermal energy scale. Uh, so if we know how much is at Kelvin, this basically tells us how much energy that corresponds to because uh, the Boltzmann relations and everything that uh, was sort of developed in statistical mechanics showed that the energy associated with an object of temperature T for a, you know, sort of a single state of uh, uh, at temperature T is one half KT. So that's basically what K is. It's the thing that turns temperatures into the energy scales. Uh, so this gives us the uh, Planck function here, and this kind of characteristic complicated function gives us the curves that you see here. Of course, the flux density in wavelength units is not the same as the flux density in um, uh, frequency units. Make sure I said wavelength and frequency in the different places. So uh, f nu and f lambda are different for the black body forms, uh, where uh, really this sort of prefactor is what is changing by that sort of c over lambda squared. Um, and we'll use that in uh, the lambda form in just a second. I'll have it written down for you. Uh, What's really useful with the black body spectrum is we have some abstractions out from it that allow us to look at sort of simple properties of it to figure out what they uh, uh, figure out what uh, is happening with objects, and is basically taking the derivatives of this complicated function. So you can take uh, or the integrals of it. So the derivative of this will find that single local maximum right here. Uh, you can't see it unless I do this. You know these local maxima. And so if I take the derivative and say what is uh, the properties of the function that set that, it turns out it's just the temperature. And basically, uh, whoever Veen is, they got a whole law named after them because they knew how to take a derivative. It didn't actually work that way. It was an empirical relationship first, but whatever. I mean, this is you take the derivative of that function and you get this relationship between the peak wavelength and the temperature of the object or the peak frequency and the temperature of the object. And so we're often used to seeing this in the context of this lambda max term of 2.898 millimeters times Kelvin uh, and then divide by temperature. So you can sort of just plug in the temperature that tells you the peak of the wavelength, plug in the peak of the wavelength, you get the temperature. Uh, the other thing is if you integrate under that curve, uh, you can come up with what's called the Stefan Boltzmann law. Uh, and that gives, so it's the integrated luminosity of a thermal source. So that basically takes out that per flux density term, integrates all the way over it uh, from zero to infinity on wavelength or on frequency, doesn't matter because it's you know over the full integral range. And you get that for a spherical emitter, that the total luminosity of it is four pi r squared, right here. Uh, which is the surface area of a sphere times sigma sb, whatever sigma sb is, times temperature of the fourth. Oh, and here's six sigma sb right here. It's one of my favorite constants uh, because it's really easy to remember because it's five, six, seven times 10 to the minus eight. So it's just five, six, seven, eight uh, with a negative sign, whatever. And then the hard part is the units, but it's watts per meter squared Kelvin to the fourth. And you can see if I plug in an area in meters squared here and a temperature in Kelvin to the fourth, I get the total luminosity of the source in watts. So those are two quantifications that we have coming out of the black body spectrum. And so what's really going to be useful is actually applying these to kind of use them here. Uh, so before we head off into application land, did anybody have any questions on that? Let's do an example. So this is uh, a, a just a application of the Planck law. 
uh, and this uh, the Planck function. Uh, this says, consider an emergent thermal emitter with temperature of T equals 10 to the 4 Kelvin. Calculate the emergent flux of light, power emitted per unit area, between 390 and 410 nanometers. Express your unit answer in watts, and I had a typo, it's actually watts per meter squared, so that's power per unit area here. Uh, I will say we need to use two pieces here. Uh, very first thing is we should use the wavelength form of the Planck law, which I have helpfully written down here for you. It says pi r squared over d squared, 2hc squared over lambda to the fifth, 1 over the each say of lambda kt. I'm going to put in some additional pieces of information for you. First, we want the emergent power, so that's at the surface of our emitter. So we're going to go ahead and take that r is equal to d. And what that means is that we're going to cancel out these two terms. Then the other thing that we're going to use is that we need to know the total uh, flux coming out. We're going to write that as f. We're going to write that as f sub lambda times delta lambda. So we're going to approximate it using this kind of box uh, representation of an integral, and I can get away with that because this is a very narrow interval in wavelength. So with those two pieces, I'm going to turn you loose and let you engage in what could only be described as a festival of physical constants. So uh, please uh, enjoy. Uh, I'll start kind of coming along and do sweeper in a couple of minutes. But if you have questions, post them. Uh, otherwise, I've opened up an e-poll, and you all can uh, get to get get your grind on. Where grinding refers to mathematics here, just so we're completely clear. That is lambda to the fifth, yeah. Yink, no problem. We'll give it a good zoom in, and I'll rewrite that as neatly as I possibly can. Oh, that's a beautiful five. I'd get a cookie if I were younger. Heck, part of being a grown-up means I can have a cookie whenever I want. Yeah, go right ahead. Uh, that's because we are doing the emergent flux of light here. And so what we're doing is we're considering the light as it comes out of the surface of a spherical emitter. So D, if we were observe, if we want to know the flux of light, say an astronomical unit away from the sun, you would plug in the radius of the sun for r, and the distance away is d. No problem.
so I've been sort of doing the setup as we go here. Uh, feel free to keep plugging in your answers as you move along. Um, the brutal part about a lot of these punks law is just getting this into the calculator. And so this is one of the reasons why I wanted to do this in class is to sort of talk about the calculator entry parts of it. Um, I actually find that if you're using just a single line scientific calculator, the easiest thing to do is to work outward from the exponential part uh, here. So basically do the this mess of constants, do the e to the x on it, subtract the one, hit the inverse button, and that puts it all into a single factor, and then multiply it by your two pi h c squared over lamb to the fifth, and then the delta lambda here. Um, I'll note a couple other things about this analysis is that I've picked a lambda, I should be in red, yep, so I picked lambda is equal to 400 nanometers because that's in the middle between my two uh, wavelengths, and uh, I picked a delta lambda of equal to 20 nanometers. And so if you see these four times 10 to the minus seven meters, that's where they're coming from. That's just the 40 nanometer pieces. So this is just, you know, it's kind of a brutal calculator entry, uh, but when you go through all of it, uh, you come out with a answer uh, here that is, uh, choo -choo, uh, here is 2.0, uh, I got 2.06, 2.07, doesn't matter. I got, haha, -ha, because it's two significant digits, I got 2.1, that's right, times 10 to the seventh watts per meter squared. Question in chat came up, could you have used the trapezoidal rule? Absolutely. The problem with the trapezoidal rule is that you have to evaluate this entire mess of, um, let's call it crap, this whole thing, you have to do it twice. Once at lambda equals 390, once at lambda equals 410, average those two. You'll get a slightly more precise value uh, for doing that, um, but you will have to, you're sort of subject to double calculator entry jeopardy. Yeah, so yeah. it is the computer's problem if you got a computer. Okie doke. Um, great. So I'm going to close the e-poll momentarily, plug them in if you got them, and then we'll move on. Any other questions on this? Cool. All right. There's my last few answers. Awesome. Okay. So that's all well and good. Uh, let's do something far less brutal, which is to actually calculate the radius of the star Rigel. Um, this is uh, the actual uh, sort of properties of the star. It has an effective temperature of 11,000 Kelvin and a luminosity of 1.8 times 10 to the 31 watts. That's the total emergent power. And here, this immediately triggers the Stefan Boltzmann law. So here, we're just going to find the radius given these other pieces. Oh, man. This is great. This is like the best type of physics where we have, you know, an equation and we have no everything in it but one constant. And then we're going to go and find that constant or one value. Now we're going to go find that value.
Whoa. All right, coming through, and oh my goodness, we are amazing. Oh wow. Okay, so yeah, as I said, best part of physics. Uh, this is the setup, solve for r, square root, uh, plug in constants, hope you get the right answer, and you end up with 4.2 times 10 to the 10 meters. Uh, big number. So the neat thing to actually do to contextualize this is to use a useful scaling that a solar radius, size of our sun, is 6.96 times 10 to the 8th meters. And if you do that, you get an answer that this is about 60 solar radii. So this is a big, bright star. Uh, for reference, the luminosity of the sun is uh, 3.9 times 10 to the uh, 26 watts. So this is 100,000 times brighter. It's bigger. It's hotter. So this is a uh, massive star here. Uh, so got a question in uh, the lecture uh, to Discord just about participation marks. I just take your e-poll questions that you answer here. And remember all of this stuff, uh, I forgive 10% of your ePoll marks regardless across the top. Anything that you apply a uh, sort of absence declaration, I'll prorate you there. And if you just are like forget lectures, these are low utility, uh, I will use the ACE clause to apply to your participation score, which is I'll just replace it with your final exam here. So participation is mostly to give you a little benefit for showing up to class and working through stuff uh, here. But hey, uh, you're adult learners, so I'm you know you you get the material how you're gonna get the material. I'm cool with all that. Okay. So let's call that that. And uh, moving on. Next question is, what's the wavelength of maximum emission for the universe, which has a temperature of 3 Kelvin? This is the Wien law. Man. And this would be hard if I had given you a, uh, you know, expect you just to know the equation. But I mean, maybe this is the best kind of physics. Here's the formula already set up. What the heck? No, don't do that. Uh, huh. Weird. Epoll just freaked out. All right, I'm going to have to... Yeah, I think I I touched my mouse. So I've uh, reopened the Epoll. If you've answered it, you'll probably have to answer it again because it got botched up again. Sorry about that. Awesome. Yeah, so people are just uh, cracking this out. You literally put three into this formula and it gives you 0 0.0966. Uh, so yeah, this is lambda is, you know, 0 0.966 millimeters. So that's about one millimeter uh, in terms of wavelength. So yeah, nice. All right. I'll give you a couple minutes on that just for pull latency, but that's a direct application. And we'll often have to sort of, you know, uh, work out those uh, sort of you know maximum wavelength here that corresponds to um, you know this temperature of thermal emitter or so on. Okay, uh, that brings me to the end of thermal emission. Uh, any final questions before we move on to angles? Shoot. Oh, this is a conversion factor. Uh, this is one solar radius is 6.96 times 10 to the eighth meters. So, yeah. I didn't ask for what it is. I'm just, I, the only reason I did that was just to sort of, you know, make sense of the big number. So, yeah, that's it. Uh, you, yeah, either, you know, I speak meters or solar radii. It's all cool. Okay, uh, closing up this e-poll, and then we're moving on. Okay, uh, the next thing that I want to talk about here uh, is how we actually map out light on uh, the surface of the sky. So 
Practically, we don't know how far away objects are, and so we use this construction of a celestial sphere, which I discussed last Friday when we got our hands dirty with the Gaia data. Uh, but more formally, what we do is we refer to measuring distances on the sky using angles. And that's kind of what, it things, what happens is if you sort of point off in one direction and you point off in the other direction, the angle between those two rays, no matter how they're oriented, there's a single angle between that plane, that gives you the angular separation Separation between those objects. And we use that construction to figure out uh, basically the orientation and map out where things are on the sky given where we are sitting here. Uh, I'll note that angles often use these sexagesimal units where a degree is 60 arc minutes and uh, each arc minute is broken into 60 arc seconds. So we have this relationship uh, where it's using this base 60 notation uh, because of the analogy, I guess, with time and uh, Babylonian uh, number counting system. So yeah, it's been with us for a little while. Uh, the, I'll switch this to over uh, here mostly because my iPad doesn't do the neat animation. So I have this sort of sketch of the celestial sphere in uh, the book here that sort of gives you the orientation. And then uh, what we really have here is, ooh, uh, thanks to something I uh, pulled off the internet, you can see that uh, while we have this sort of fixed geometry for uh, the celestial sphere, the Earth is rotating with respect to the stars. And so the celestial sphere is fixed, and then the Earth is spinning underneath it. And this means that there's a good or, uh, correspondence between lines of latitude on the celestial sphere, and, or lines of declination on the celestial sphere, and lines of latitude on the Earth. Those are always kind of lined up because the Earth is rotating, and it's kind of rotationally symmetric in a way that the lines of latitude remain kind of uh, fixed. But what's changing is the relationship between longitude and the right ascension of the stars. And so this, you know, is at the, you know, the Earth's rotation is at the heart of a lot of problems like uh, celestial navigation uh, in the era of sort of trying to go around on the oceans in fragile wooden boats and figure out where you are. Uh, this was a major problem. And it turns out that the thing that links the longitude and the right ascension is the passage of time. And that's what ultimately solved the longitude problem was the ability to keep track of time effectively. Uh, so there is this rotation effect that uh, will cause these coordinates to mix, uh, to mix and match uh, over the course of time, and one day brings you back around to where you uh, started here. So uh, given that piece, uh, we like to map out the surface of the, of the sky in this right ascension and declination space. So to make these slides here, I just literally went into the other window where I was doing my research and pulled out uh, some of the images that I've been using and uh, you know on whatever day this was. And so we have a map here in terms of these right ascension and declination units. And the weird thing about right ascension is because of this calendar association with the rotation of the Earth, it is me it's measured in sexagesimal units, but it's actually measured often in sexagesimal units of time and not in units of arc. So we get into this weird thing. I'm going to try to shield you from that, but sometimes you'll ask, like, why is this here and not there? And the answer is, be like, oh, that's where it is measured in time, not an angle. But I'm just putting this out there as one of these big gotchas in the astronomical uh, coordinate system. Anyways, uh, so... The key thing is if you're measuring in units of time, one hour is 15 uh, degrees, because uh, there's 24 hours is 360. You do some division, that's what you get. Really, the key point uh, when you're doing this is if we have to measure the angular scale on something, reference it to the uh, latitude-like axis, because that's sort of fixed. It doesn't have weird units. It's kind of a nice uh, feature. Uh, of this. So this is a uh, map in these units, and if we care about the angular scale, I would sort of look at something like this, and I'd say, okay, that has a um, angular extent of about, 50, uh, about five arc minutes, and I got five arc minutes by just looking at this scale right here, and say its extent, sort of the angle between a ray going to one side of it up here, and the other side of it down here, that would be about five arc minutes. I would just read that off of the vertical axis. So 
Uh, the reason why we might want to do this is we often have to make this association between how big something appears on the sky, its angle, and the distance to it. That allows us to make a physical uh, relationship to, between the physical size. Critically, uh, if you uh, think about a physical object at different distances, it appears smaller when it's farther away. And when we say appears smaller, what we're saying is that the angle subtended by it, measured from a ray on one side of the object to the ray on the other side of the object, is smaller. So it's not actually physically smaller. We know this. We have like a wonderfully well developed visual cortex, which informs us of all this. Uh, but the, what we actually see with our eyeballs is the angular extent. And when we look through the telescope, we see the angular extent. And for most things on the sky, which are kind of small compared to one radian in angular extent, we use this small angle approximation that the size of the object we'll call it S, is the distance to the object times the angle measured here in one uh, in, in units of radians. And so using what we just covered and this, we can actually infer the physical size of objects. And I want to do this with another uh, image that we have right here. This is an F435W uh, image of the nearby galaxy M33, and this is a region affectionately known as NGC 604 in it. Uh, NGC stands for New General Catalog. A lot of the objects we'll be looking at will have NGC numbers, uh, and this is a giant star forming region in this nearby galaxy. I told you it's an F435W, you know from the filters, and this is a Hubble image, and it has sort of a wavelength about 435 nanometers. So, so much is baked into the jargon I just went and uh, spat out at you. But what's cool about this is with this map, we can go ahead and measure how big this object is if we know how far away it is. So what I can do is sort of measure over from one uh, side to the other side of this object in kind of in units. I, I want the diameter of it and I want it in projection. So I just measure over here and I would say that this is something that's like, oh, that looks like it's about uh, 18 arc seconds. I'm just reading off the scale here. That's 18. This thing down here, that looks to be about 40 to 50. Uh, be about 44 arc seconds and then there's a interval in between it so the extent between these two is going to be uh, 16 arc seconds to get to here yeah and then 18 arc seconds to go up here and so this total unit is going to be 34 seconds of arc and so that's how I'd measure the angular size of it, just referencing again, always to that vertical axis. And from there, I'm going to use this expression that S is equal to D theta. I know D, I just figured out theta, so I can figure out how big this object is. And so if I plug this in, I know that the distance here is 859 times 10 to the three parsecs. And I'm gonna multiply it by that angle. That's 34 arc seconds. And then I'm going to use the relationships that I learned that I rattled off earlier, which is that uh, 60 arc seconds is one arc minute. Uh, 60 arc minutes is one degree. And then one that I haven't told you, but you uh, probably have in your back pocket, which is that pi radians is equal to 180 degrees. So now I have this whole angle converted into radians, and something that I find incredibly useful is I just sort of have in my back pocket, this is not one of those things I'm asking you to know, but it's very useful to remember, is that there are 206265 arc seconds in one radian. So I can just you know, do this calculation uh, pretty quickly if I know that, and if I whip all uh, those numbers out, I get that this is about 120 parsecs across. So this tells me the physical size of this object is 120 parsecs. And you don't have a great reference for that yet, but uh, I happen to know that's about a characteristic thickness of a galactic disk, or you know, a nearby star is about one parsec away. So we can see sort of off two distances, like you know, 
the Pleiades is 120 parsecs away from us. So that gives us kind of, you know, a sense of, you know, this is a big region, all of which is filled, uh, filled with these high mass newly formed stars. Okay, so that's a quick, uh, 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 a quick sort of uh, introduction to angular scales. Does anybody have a question about how I did that kind of that analysis? I see one coming in, so I'm gonna hold. Oops. Ah. Can I repeat how I got the 34 arc seconds? So yeah, absolutely. I measured uh, across here uh, between the top over to the axis and this line on the top hits at about 18 arc seconds uh, on this scale, which is 30 degrees, 47 minutes and zero arc seconds, 10 arc seconds, 18 arc seconds to there. And then this is, uh, I measured across to the bottom, and then that hits 44 arc seconds. And so then what we do is we go, uh, and then we say, okay, from 44 arc seconds up to this minute line here, that's 16. And then this is 18, because 60 minus 44 is 16. Uh, so that's where that 16 came from. And then the 18 came from going from 0 up to 18. And then I add those two angles together to get the total distance here. Next question came in, which is, could you find the diameter with the right ascension as well? Yes, but there's a couple corrections you have to be aware of. First is that this is uh, units of time. So you have to know that this is two minutes of time. And then you have to convert that to angles... Uh, in radians, so you have to know that it's in different units. The other thing is that because the lines of right ascension converge as you get into the as you approach the north celestial pole, you have to correct for that effect, which means you have to multiply by the cosine of the declination. So you would read across here and you put that in. So yes, you absolutely can do this, and sometimes, like I would have to in my day job uh, or night job. Uh, you know, if when I'm doing research, I have to sometimes use those axes. But uh, there are some corrections you have to get into to take into account that the celestial sphere is the sphere and not the celestial cube. All right. So uh, we have other coordinate systems that we use in the sky. The one that we will probably use more than right ascension and declination is the system that's called galactic coordinates, where we have these variables uh, called the galactic longitude and the galactic latitude, L and B. And these are just measured in degrees, no weird units of time because we're not spinning with respect to the galaxy. We don't have to steer telescopes this way. So this is nice. Uh, this is uh, sort of a zoom in on the galactic coordinates uh, system, and you can sort of see it here. Uh, this We set this up so that we are here, that's labeled us with the sun, and then the line of zero longitude points to the galactic center. So the galactic, this is showing the position of the galactic longitude as if we're top down looking at our galaxy here. And so 180 is towards the galactic anti-center, uh, 90 degrees is sort of off, you know, you know, 0, 290, 180, 270. For reference, the sun is moving around the galaxy towards the L equals 90 position. Why is it L and B? I don't actually know. I think it uh, has to do with the German uh, observers who developed this. But I just, you know, L and B are the variables we usually measure, and they are in degrees. Uh, Reflecting in the Gaia units, uh, this is uh, you know somewhat hard to see, and I apologize for that. But we think about uh, the galactic longitude. This is the galactic center. Galactic longitude runs along this position through the sky that we call the galactic equator. That's the L equals zero line, or sorry, the B equals zero line here. Uh, up top is the north galactic pole. Down south is the south galactic pole and then b is the galactic latitude so if we see high galactic latitudes that means we're looking up here in this part of the sky or negative galactic latitudes would be down here we're looking away from the plane of our galaxy we're going to care about this coordinate system a lot because this tells us it's very naturally a sort of cylindrical 
or a spherical polar coordinate system that's oriented with the native cylindrical geometry of the galaxy, which is kind of, you know, there's something at the center and it's uh, sort of the relevant coordinates are sort of azimuthal around and then the distance out of the galactic plane. Here. So we'll be using LNB probably more than our AN deck, but that I just wanted to introduce both of those. The final thing is introduce, not the final thing, but getting to the final thing is this notion of parallax. Parallax gives us the distances to nearby objects. We did a quick introduction with the Gaia data. Um, and here we're using this geometric effect from looking at stars on different sides of the Earth's orbit. And we set up this angle geometry here where we say that the tangent of this angle P, so if we look at the star over the course of the year, it appears to move back and forth on the sky. And so we sort of see it, uh, you know, on one side of the orbit, it's over here when we're here. Uh, and then on the other side of the orbit, it appears here relative to here. For the background objects, these days we use these quasars, uh, which are radio, uh, low, radio bright uh, um, accreting supermassive black holes that are located basically halfway across the visible universe. And so they're so far away that even though they are moving through space uh, sort of slowly, we assume, we never see them move. So this gives us this incredibly fixed reference system to measure everything with respect to. And so we just measure the stars moving with background with respect to these, uh, or, or moving with respect to this background coordinate system that we anchor all our coordinate references to. Uh, given that motion, we can use the geometry of the angle, and we use this thing at P, which is called the parallax angle, and you notice that's half of the total motion. And so we have this angle here is the uh, parallax, and that sets up a nice right triangle where the distance between the Earth and the Sun is one astronomical unit. That's the opposite side of uh, a triangle. The distance to the star is the adjacent side, and so we opposite over adjacent here to give me the tangent of the parallax angle is 1 AU over D. Typically, the uh, we're again in the small angle approximation. The uh, largest parallax of a star is about one arc second, so this is one two hundred thousandth of a radian very good opportunity to use a uh, small angle approximation. And under that, the tangent of P is approximately P, usual admonishment about small angle approximations, only in radians. So uh, we actually define this unit called a parsec, which is um, uh, the parallax, uh, we scale it to the native kind of size of a parallax angle, which is one second of arc. And a parsec is 3.09 uh, times 10 to the 6 meters. And I should give the secret of where this comes from, which is the conversion from arc seconds into radians. So this is 206265, familiar number, right? Uh, times one astronomical unit. And 1 AU is 1.49 times 10 to the 11 meters. Uh, I'll just write that down for completeness. So that's where this unit of a parsec comes from. It's a parallax arc second, or a parsec. Okay, this is great because it allows us to get to the distances of nearby stars. So you can just apply this immediately. Uh, and I should note, uh, let's see here, one parsec is 3.09 times 10 to the 16 meters, because that'll allow you to do the final conversion. And I'll be able to just say, if a star has a parallax of 50 milli arc seconds, how far away is it?
right, this is good. I'm seeing the answers come in. This is uh, substitute in the trick here. Uh, the only trick is that this is 50 milli arc seconds, not 50 arc seconds. So you have to put in a multiply by 10 to the minus 3 to get it into the formula because it's dimensionalized to units of arc seconds, not milli arc seconds. And so from there, uh, 1 over 0 0.05 is 20. So this is 20 parsecs. And then we scale that by this conversion factor of 1 parsec is 3.09 times 10 to the 16 meters, messier than usual, so sorry. And then that is, uh, oh, I could probably even do that without referring to my notes, 6.2 times 10 to the 17 meters. Brilliant. Okay, uh, so I'll leave that up here and I'll just do a little blah blah at the end, which is on Friday. We're going to do another sort of look at observational data. I'll wrap up just a couple pieces of the sort of theory here because I'm, you know, lagging behind because I tend to talk too much. Uh, so I'll spend about 10 minutes going over the last few slides from this section. Then we'll go and we'll look at Gaia data. Our topic for Friday is we're going to look at an actual research article. So the main topic for Friday is going to be how to read a journal article. So we'll go over that and I'll show you a uh, actual journal article. And then part of what we'll be doing for the following week is we're going to be uh, gauging in sort of a targeted read of that article using all of the information that we've got so far to kind of unpack what is happening in uh, an actual bit of research. So until that time, uh, see you all later. Uh, if you have any questions about homework, Hit me up on Discord, send an email, uh, and then we'll uh, be in touch. Okay, uh, thanks to all, and have a good one.